Big Buck Registries, Big Buck Podcast, episode number 100. A tribute to Lane Benoit, part one. Part two tomorrow, part three the next day. Big Buck Registry is a virtual museum of hunting stories. We preserve a piece of Americana by interviewing and recording hunters about their hunts and experiences from across the country. And who knows, maybe we'll learn a thing or two along the way that'll help us take our hunt to the next level. Welcome to another episode of the Big Buck Registry's Big Buck Deer Hunting Podcast. This is Jay Scott. When I started this podcast a couple years ago, I had no idea where it would go. But it's led me to some unbelievable spots with some unbelievable people that I can't say thank you enough to. In particular, I'd like to thank Dusty Phillips for joining me on a very early episode when he shot his Chubby Tines buck. He is an instrumental and very important part of this show. I bounce ideas off of him every day. And without him, this show would not be where it is today. This is episode 100, and episode 100 deserves something special, and I couldn't think of anything better than to pay tribute to my friend, my deer hunting friend, Lane Benoit, who passed away just recently. There is an empty spot in my life, as I'm sure there are for many outdoorsmen, and any time a great hunter passes, it certainly hits home. So what I thought I should do is to go find many of Lane's friends and get in some insight as to how they knew Lane in part one of episode 100, a tribute to Lane Benoit. First, we speak with Hal Blood on hunting together again. I went over to visit Larry. I was me and Chris was was uh, was my partner Chris Dalty, my big woods business. We were going to we were going to Vermont fishing over on Champlain to do a TV show. And on the way over, I got thinking I like to stop and see Larry again. So I call Larry and he goes, "Yeah, yeah." He says, "You stop right in." So I can't remember if it was on the way over or back, but it doesn't matter. And uh, we had a nice visit with with uh, Larry. I don't know when you used to visit him. He He'd want to spend all day with you, but we'd been there a few hours, and it was getting later and later on, and we were saying goodbye to him, getting ready to leave, and Lane showed up, and uh, so then he wanted to talk, so we ended up staying another hour anyways, but Lane came in, and he had Larry's uh, supper all warmed up on a plate with tin foil over it, and, and uh, brought him his supper and said he'd been doing that every day, you know, pretty much since his mother had passed on, and he would come check on his father every day, and yeah. Spent some time with him every evening after he got out of work. So that just kind of struck me as, you know, just the way he was, you know, caring about his father and, and stuff like that. So now I would say they're up there in the sky hunting together again. I know? agree. I agree. I'd say hunting's pretty good for the Lord right now. Yeah. So I, you know, I don't know if this, it's all in a plan, you know what I mean? It's kind of, you know, you, you miss people like that and stuff like that, but we don't have any control over it. Right. Yeah, it's as Lane used to say, it is what it is. Yeah, yeah, I bet, you know, talk to Lane all the time. You know, we'd always run into each other. We'd be at the same sportsman show sometimes, and he was always a guy that would go out of his way to say hi to everybody and, you know, talk to everybody, and, you know, he always said to us, because, you know, a lot of times people would think we think that me and my guys in my big woods business would be like competitors because we did seminars too and sold dvds and you know lane was the one that pointed out we never looked at it that way i never did and he never did we we're all on the same team you know we we're all you know kind of shooting for the same goals to teach people how to hunt and track and and it wasn't a wasn't a competition you know it was was just all about you know helping the people out that wanted to learn from us right you were both hunting similar styles in the same kind of areas. Yeah, similar style. The, the only other thing I'd say mainly is is I know those guys, you know, tracked most of the time. All of them did. You know, they didn't they didn't do a lot of hunting on the bare ground. 
they they'd come to Maine initially when they started coming to Maine. They'd pretty much come for the whole season and just kind of hang around and wait for snow. You know what I mean? They'd go search out the snow in the mountains, but they didn't really they didn't really go around and still hunt a heck of a lot. They started doing that when they went out to Ontario. You know, because a lot of times there was no snow out there. So and there was a, there was a lot more deer in Ontario when they started going. So it was it was pretty easy to kill a buck out there still hunting around them burns and clear cuts. But out this way, they they mostly they mostly just tracked and that's why you know i had to because of guiding i ended up i had to hunt every day every day of the week no matter what the conditions were and and uh so a lot of my information my books and all that is about hunting in the big woods whether there's snow or not you know bare ground places to put stands how to still hunt you know i wrote a lot about that stuff but the tracking end of it i think we were pretty much did a lot of the similar things, you know. Gotcha, gotcha. What are you going to miss the most about Lean? Well, I'd say it's a, it's a tight-knit group of guys that do what we do, you know, and especially the ones that teach what we do. So we're down a man now, you know. It's like Blood Brothers or something, you know. Now we're, da- we're down a man on that, you know. Right, right. And uh, his brothers ain't getting any younger either, and quite frankly, I'm not, you know. I'm, I'm going to be 58 this spring, so... It kind of gets me thinking, you know. Uh, you know, get got to take care of our bodies. The older you get, the the hotter it gets a little bit, and you really got to take care of yourself, you know. Right, gotcha. So I just miss him being around in the in the hunting community, you know, and following what he does on Facebook. I know he was just getting a start in his new thing with his boy, and that was kind of that was kind of disappointing too when that happened because he just started getting a gig going with his son Jeb there, or Zeb, yeah. and, and uh, so. That kind of ended it all, but yeah. so that's what I miss. You know, I miss having him around to teach people and you know spread the word about what we do. Next, we speak with Richard Bernier on the unselfish Lane Benoit. Well, you know, my time with uh, the entire family goes back to the uh, early '80s, and. Uh, and the, the the striking thing about Lane, and and this really you know is about Lane tonight, is uh, and and no disrespect or or to to any of the his brothers or or his late dad, but uh, the thing about Lane that that struck me as being so much different from any of the other players as as they're known you know nationwide was Lane was unpretentious, you know he. Uh, you know, he it, 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 he he wasn't looking for anybody to know who he was. He just lived life, right? And 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 it, and it appeared <clears throat> that uh, Lane lived it um, in a way that uh, made him feel good. Um, he enjoyed it, and and I think a lot of the stigma with Lane uh, initially on was, of course, that big burly beard and 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 hair everywhere. And I'm quite envious of the fact that he had all that hair, uh, <laughs> and. And, uh, and and his booming voice, but once you get past all of that, inside was was a warm-hearted guy that uh, I think would probably do anything for anybody. Yeah, and, I would agree. With and that. some and some sometimes, you know, the stigma is that uh, you know people can't get past the uh, the outer surface, uh, and and uh, often indeed are the times when when you do, you really find out you know what somebody's really like. Right. Richard, did you spend any time with in the woods with Lane? I, I didn't. And, and here's how it used to go. Um, it was kind of a, a, a – early on, it wasn't a rivalry, but it was a, it was a stipulated thing. When we hunted up in northern Maine, I don't mind talking about this now because the deer are all but gone up there. And uh, really a, another whole story, and it's sad. Uh, but <clears> – <throat> The big bog located north of the Golden Road, and, and back in the early 80s, you know, there was only one ro- run road in there. And uh, Benoit's would set up camp on the eastern side of the bog with their school buses, and the Bernies would set up camp on the western side of the, the big bog in a camper, and uh, never the two shall wander into the other's side of the bog. Gotcha. And, and on Sundays, we'd go and visit, and... Uh, shoot in the pit and, and shoot the breeze and, and that was always a that was always a fun time and see how each other was doing what they were seeing for sign what they were you know if anybody shot anything and uh 
So in, in terms of being in the same general areas, yes. Um, hunted some of the same general areas out in western Ontario uh, with Lane. In fact, you know, often I'd see Lane downtown on a, on a pay phone or something of that nature and stop and say, hey, you lost, and he'd chuckle and laugh. And, <laughs> and uh, um, so, you know, but, but never hunted, you know. And, and, and here's the thing about Lane, again, that sets him apart, I think, and, and probably has more of my respect is that Lane basically enjoyed the solitude of the woods. He, he wasn't uh, he wasn't a gang hunter. I know he shared a lot of hunts with his with his best friend Dave Coker. I'm sure you're aware of Dave. Absolutely, yeah. And um, but Lane was uh, in fact Dave Coker was with Lane when he shot the I I believe it's the heaviest buck ever killed by any of any of the Benoits. The one he shot in Maine that dressed 284, and that was two days after he shot it. And uh, I saw that buck hanging, and uh, it was it was immense. And um, and, and, and even at that, you know, Lane Lane was like, yeah, yeah, it's a nice deer, you know, and and it just <laughs> it it wasn't like, I mean, a lot of the guys that I know, a lot of guys that are they're in positions of, if you will, um, prestige or perceived they are. I mean, they they would have gone nuts with a deer like that. They would have taken that to the bank, and Lane just thought it was okay. You know, yeah, yeah it's great deer. Um, and moved, and, and and I think he probably felt the same way about the next deer that might have weighed two hundred. Right. And and that's how he was. And and you know what you see is what you got with with him. And uh, he was always Lane was always the first person wherever I was speaking at a show. Lane was always the first person to walk over, shake hands, and say, "Hey, how'd your season go?" So you know, it, it uh, it's amazing how you can be in the same family but yet be so di- different. Right. Um, you know, uh, probably deer for deer, um, Lanny may well be the best of of all of them. And 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 again, all that I'm saying here is is personal opinion. Um, and so I, I have no records to, to substantiate any of this or whatnot, but, but you know what, in terms of getting it done in a variety of conditions, particularly on bare ground, you know, there was no one better than Lane. And, and my dad, when, when I was growing up, you know, he told me, he says, listen, if you can't still hunt on bare ground, you're never going to be able to track deer. And I think both go hand in hand. And when you can do both equally well, you, you don't get any better than that, Jay. Yeah. That's a well-rounded, right. uh. You know, and and so, yeah, I I, I really think that probably Lane, again, my opinion, uh, out of the out of the entire family was what may well have been the most rounded out deer hunter amongst them. That doesn't matter what the condition, Lane's going out there, and 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 you know what, I wouldn't bet against him. I agree. I mean, I I pale in comparison to uh, the Benoits as far as their skill set, and uh, I do okay, but no, I just. Uh, I don't know if I'll ever get to the level that the Benoits were at or where Lane was at, and I was just getting to know him more in over the last 12 months than I'd ever known him, where he was starting to teach me some things, and he's uh, he's going to be severely missed overall. And would you say that the the like where you you were hunting in Maine, that there was the it was almost like the Hatfield McCoy line, where it was the Bernie or Benoit line? No, at that time it was it was it was it was sort of um, there was no rivalry, and, and both sides were interested in, in what you did. And I will say, Jay, you know, as as you know, as, as I uh, proliferated, if you will, as a writer, and, and came out with the first book and the second book, uh, and started speaking, and you know, there was some tension that rose, and, and I'm not certain that I'm not certain there was tension um, initially by the Benoit family as much as perhaps outsiders uh, instigating things or whatnot. And uh, so there was some tension. I mean, uh, where there wasn't before. Larry, Larry stayed in my house several times. I stayed in his. And um, so it was, it was a little disappointing at that point in my career that um, that would, that would, that would happen. And, uh, and then some things happened within the family itself that literally I didn't want to be any part of. I, I did gotcha. not want to get in the middle of any of right. that. And so I literally 
and literally backed away, backed away and said, okay, Dick Bernie, how do you reinvent yourself as to be not take away from anything you're doing or the style of hunting, but yet be different. Right. And, and that's what I tried to, you know, that's what I have attempted to do. And, uh, while at the same time looking at a distance from guys that I admired way back when. And, uh, so, you know, uh, when something like this happens, especially unexpectedly, you know, it, it hit home. It, it hits home. I mean, um, way too young. I mean, way too soon. And I could see his eyes would dance much like his dad's. Right. When somebody had a question or somebody wanted to see if he would, I mean, he would jump in. He, he was energetic to teach people how to do what he, I'm sure, had taken for granted. Gotcha. And, and that's a rare person that wants to do that. Yep. And it, have you added any kind of repertoire to your hunting skill set that you learned from Lane? Uh, still, I mean, you know, I used to be, God, boy, I can't wait till it snows. I can't wait till it snows so I can, you know, and, 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 and boy, I, I, I said, well, wait a minute, listen, man, I was trained on bare ground to, to still hunt. And, you know, if I've got to wait till it snow falls, I said, some seasons I might not hunt. And I said, so I need to, I need to go back to school, so to speak. And, uh, and put that woodsmanship skills to work. And, and there's no reason why I can't kill a nice buck on bare ground any more than I can on snow. And, and literally when I put my mind back to that and started paying attention to what I should have been doing, uh, things all just came back together and, uh, it didn't have to, to, to date now, Jay, if it doesn't snow in, in deer season, I, it, I, I, it, I'm not boohooing. I don't care. It doesn't matter. Right. I feel like I'm just as effective on bare ground as I am on snow. And, um, I, yeah, I mean, there's some seasons where I said, okay, now I really don't, don't I hope it doesn't snow uh, because I've got this buck figured out and uh, that'll only mess things up if it does snow. Right. So, yeah, I mean, in, in terms of the way Lane went about that, yeah, I mean, so borrowing from, from, from him on that, absolutely. I, I tire now of listening to guys that, that, that whine, if you will, that, oh, I wish it would snow. And, and you know what, Jay? 85% of them don't know what to do when it does snow. And, and so basically I just, you know what, go wherever I speak. One of the points I make is this conditions change day to day, sometimes hour by hour. We hunt the most adaptable big game on the planet, or at least in North America. Right. What we fail to do as hunters with, with a far superior brain is we fail to adapt to the conditions that we have in front of us. And because we don't, we don't succeed. Very and, true. and I think yeah. I think I think Lane was 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 great at adapting to the conditions he had in front of him. I agree with that. Uh, wh what are you going to miss the most about Lane Benoit? You know, with that new tracking series that he had started, and 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 boy, at that at the age he was doing it, I'm thinking, wow, Lane, that's ambitious. You know, and again, looking at it from not having even having a conversation with him regarding that is, um, and and watching him as and there's a couple. There's a couple other points I want to make, Jay. And, and if you'd give me time to do it, I, absolutely. I think they're important. But uh, uh, I'm going to get to the answer that question. Is um, you know, I thought I think there's a whole lot more insight that that Lane had that is is never going to come forward. It's never going to be heard. It's never going to be seen. Um, and, and I think that's a bit of a tragedy. Um, and the 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 fact that. Uh, there's not a lot of there's not a lot of tried and true deer trackers left. It's it's if you will, people would say it's a dying art. It's a long, and I'm hoping that's not the case. I'm hoping everything is is circular and it's going to come back around and people are going to realize that oh no, this this is this is the way to hunt. Uh, but when you lose somebody that prolific and and do so suddenly, you know it it, it sends shockwaves through the, the whole the whole community. And, 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 and hopefully I guess that the people will, will sit back and, and realize, listen, boy, I, I, you know, don't take anything for granted. Don't take anything for granted. L literally live life to the fullest. And, and that, which segues me into a thing I, I did want to uh, say, Jay, and, I, and sure. at least it's important to me. Yes. Is this, this speaks volumes about the man that he was as well. 
is the fact that I know, I know that Lane sacrificed hunting time, his own pursuit, over the course of at least the last two seasons prior to this year, ensuring that his dad was out hunting and did whatever he could to put him in a position to succeed. That's a very, very good point. You're absolutely right. And, and you know what? That's unselfish. And, and that's why I can fairly say that Lane was unpretentious. Right. And he cared more about ensuring that, that his dad, you know, had the opportunity while he could. And that, didn't, that wasn't just deer hunting. That was turkey hunting. That was anything that, that, that he could ensure that. So, and, and Lane went without deer in order to, in order to ensure that that happened. And, and I, again, that, that just speaks volumes of, of who Lane Benoit was. Yeah, he, he touched uh, many people in that way and, and was always willing to give you a hand, uh, whether it was a tip or, uh, and, and that's how he put himself out there, is just he wanted to share his knowledge to make you a better hunter. And that's just amazing. And, 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 and that, it didn't matter who you were. It did not matter who you were to Lane Benoit. Right. If you wanted the knowledge, if you wanted the information, he'd give it to you. He didn't judge. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm going to ask. I'm going to ask the question: If there's something that maybe you've seen that nobody else seen that really never uh, got above ground for everybody to to witness or experience, is is there anything that you can mention that uh, maybe was something that wasn't shared? Well, I can I can tell you that <clears throat> again. I, I you know so many today you know are are into hero worship and and you know and i i look at i look at things from a different perspective you know i've been really successful in a number of things including deer hunting and 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 and, and i'm very appreciative of the fact that i've been able to do what i've done but you know the most important things in life at least in my opinion aren't necessarily the things that show the most and you know i i watched lane you know build a build a home for his family and and the way that Lane uh raised his son with Irene and 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 in a way that uh you know that that and didn't make a big deal out of it but yet nurtured and raised that that young young boy into the man he is today um and and never missed a beat uh, was part of the wrestling program uh for his son uh, drove the bus, did a whole host of things that nobody would know. And, and he did it because, you know what, it needed to be done, I'm going to do it. And, and wasn't looking for a pat on the back or congratulate. Lane would raffle off a hunt with himself in order to raise money for the school wrestling team. Right. That's Lane Benoit. That is Lane Benoit. Nobody, not many people know that. Right. right. That, that, that's something that, you know, I'm glad you shared because it's, uh, it's an awesome thing that uh, Lane did. And, and you know, that, that, that needs to be carried forward. Well, I mean, you know, here's the thing. <clears throat> you know, sometimes folks put their priorities in the wrong places. And, and, and to me, deer hunting is a recreational sport, and I love to do it. I've spent most of my adult life studying, photographing, hunting, writing, talking about the animal. But, you know, when it, when it comes down to times like this where somebody's literally left us again far too soon, um, you know, yes, they'll be remembered for, for being the kind of deer hunter they were, but that doesn't define the man. What defines the man are some of the things that I've shared with you that maybe you guys weren't expecting to hear. You know, maybe you were hoping you're going to hear some legendary stories of tracking deers through the, you know, swamps and mountains, and which he did. But, you know, to remember a man for the things that he did that were really important, um, I think significantly talk about who he was. And they'll be long remembered by his family after they've forgotten about some of the deer he shot. Yeah, uh, agreed. You you, uh, you made me and and Jay both see another side of the lane that wasn't wasn't out there. It wasn't in the public eye. No, and you know what? And that's Lane. Right. Again, he didn't do anything anything to be showy. That wasn't him. But just it it was not him. Well, I, I think that's what separated him from the rest. Oh, there you are. Completely I'll agree. tell you, here's, here's, another, here's another part. And it wasn't that because he'd so amassed so many deer. Because I know when I mess up on a deer that I've tracked and I've worked for, I'm, I'm really not happy at the moment. And it happens. And it happens to everyone, whether they want to admit it or not. But they had a PBS special um, that they linked with, uh, with the Field and Stream, linked with uh, uh, the tribute to, to, to Lane. And 
you know, and Lane tracked that buck on not too much snow, got that close and then missed him. And, and his reaction was so Lane. That was him. Yeah. I get all excited. I missed. <laughs> okay. Man. I mean, but you know what? That was him. We'll go find another one. That's awesome. He God. enjoyed he enjoyed the challenge. And, you know, I've got a piece I'm working on uh, for uh, publication. And uh, I was looking over it today, and, and, it's, and it's literally titled Seeking. And part of the seeking is the actual hunt itself. And I, I believe Lane embodied the actual hunt itself. He enjoyed the hunt itself, not necessarily the rewards at the end of the hunt. Right, which is different. It's not always it's the different. reward. It's just the experience that you get. He enjoyed the hunt to its fullest. Yes, he did. Yep. And, uh, again, that sets him apart to a, to a great degree. It wasn't a means to an end. It was, it was, this is the journey, and I'm enjoying every aspect of that journey. Right. I know of guys, that friends of mine, that have seen Lane back and beyond in, in the New Hampshire mountains or, or in the Vermont places, and and... A lot of guys, you know, if they were back in there looking and scouting or whatnot, and Lane did the scouting, and uh, they would be terribly upset to think somebody was back in there. Nope, not Lane. He backs his Jeep up, he pulls over, he gets out, and he has a two-hour conversation with him and starts sharing information about deer he knows on that mountain. That's Lane Benoit. Next up. Steve Beckwith asks, what would the slammer do? Lane got in touch with me and another friend of mine back uh, five, six years ago, and uh, he wanted to come to Maine. He was just getting into turkey hunting, and uh, he wanted to come to Maine and see if he could shoot a bird up this way. So uh, me and another friend uh, got together and with Lane and took him out, and uh, he shot his first bird uh, with uh, with the two of us. And... Um, the other friend's name was Nathan Fenderson, and uh, uh, we had a a wonderful time, and it created a long-lasting uh, friendship uh, by uh, getting involved with him in turkey hunting. That turned into, you know, uh, taking care of his uh, personal website and uh, joining me at many shows. Uh, last year, he uh, attended the Rockingham. Uh, sporting show and didn't have a booth so he came down to the mainhunters.com booth and stayed with us for the day on saturday and all of his fans came you know to talk to him and we got to meet a lot of them and meet a lot of his acquaintances and go out on many dinner occasions with him and lane and i you know share tons and tons of uh, phone messages back and forth so sure um over the five years that uh, he and i were friends and Missing greatly at this point. So, yeah, as man. does many sportsmen. <laughs> man, he's affected you know? the lives of many, many sportsmen. There's no question. I mean, right down to the the grain of your being. Um, certainly did that for yep. me. You know, there's just kind of the way I live my life. I, I a lot of or some of it definitely came from Lane. Like just how he viewed the world. Uh, no question. Exactly. About it. Yeah. He shared those views so openly, and uh, between like yourself and myself and other hunters out there. And um, you, you do adapt um, some of his methods and ways of thinking. And uh, he, he was a very logical sportsman um, that uh, could relate to any – he was a big buck tracker, but he could relate to what my team does, which is, you know, we're, uh, we're the weekend warriors. We, we go out hunting, and, um, you know, guys on uh, that are main hunters that we call them, um, you know, they're happy with shooting a, a spike horn if that's what – if they're – excited about it and they're thrilled about that type of a hunt um our team is behind people that like to do that kind of hunting lane was a major major buck tracker and that was his forte and but he had a full respect for the whole gambit of all of hunters uh, that's why he was so well liked and his family is so well liked they are just great people i can't tell you how many times i, I was in the woods and i'd be on a track and i and i get to a, a a crossroads, so to speak, and I'd say, what would Lane do right now? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, I just do uh, that a lot. Myself included, yeah, myself included. In fact, uh, he started doing some tips in the woods this year and gave me a phone call after he had done some using his cell phone and uh, said, hey, Steve, you should start doing that. And um, 
you know, there was a tip right there. Lane turned me on to bringing my iPhone in the woods with me and putting out some pro tips while I'm sitting in the woods in between hunts. And he just was a great guy like that. Yeah, he really was. He was always willing to share a, an idea or a tip that he learned or just stuff he's known for years. And he's probably forgotten exactly. more about big buck tracking than I'll ever know. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, that, that is so true. Uh, you know, and that, that's what the, that's what the shocker is to all of us in the sporting world that um, knew Lane and, and were friends with him. And even if you didn't know him, you felt like you were friends with him. Right. And, um, you know, we're going to all miss that, that we can't. I, I personally have picked up my cell phone several times in the last few weeks and started to text him or dial his phone number and caught myself in the middle of it. And, you know, uh, it's just a hard situation. You know, the tears start running and you you think about your old friend, you know. So. Absolutely, and uh, that'll happen for a very, very long time, probably until the day I die, too. Um, yep. <laughs> yeah. What uh, What was your your favorite um, funny idiosyncrasy that Lane had? Well, you know, I don't really think there was anything that I considered uh, about Lane to you know that that I could chuckle about. I guess uh, I guess it, it would have to be you know his nickname, Slammer. Slammer. And uh, it's very fitting, you know. Um, he's, uh, you know, he shot Slammer Bucks, you know, and that was his uh, uh, calling card, <laughs> so to speak. Yeah. And uh, yeah. we all know what he meant when he said his name was Slammer. His email is Slammer. His <laughs> everything he had about him was Slammer. So um, he, you know, just um, I guess I would have to say, you know, that would be a um, something that he developed uh, and nicknamed himself and. Not many people I know call himself Slammer. <laughs> yeah, that was that was something pretty special. That you know, just to he kind of coined that term and made it something. You know, Slammer was never really any word, any special word until Lane started us- using it. And anybody, yeah. anybody in the outdoor word world, if you said Slammer, you knew that it was who he was. Who he was? <laughs> Where's the Slammer yeah. today? Yeah, that's Lane Benoit. Yeah. That's for sure. Um, yeah, and that that's one thing that I've taken from it and, uh, you know, really enjoyed about him. So he was, he, uh, he knew how to promote himself and, uh, but he wasn't uh, an edgy type of person at all. He, um, just let things naturally flow, um, and let things be. And he was working hard at getting his own show rolling and it was coming right along. And, uh, he'd been talking to me about it quite frequently. In fact, he was about to join my uh, New England Outback network and get his show onto mine network and it just uh may or may not happen now we'll see how things work out for zeb and right. uh his cameraman paul i understand they're going to continue on so um and keep doing what lane was doing and promoting it and promoting the benoits and i think that uh all i can say is zeb had an awesome teacher <laughs> yeah can so you, can i you, think he'll do well can you imagine having the the uh, professor uh that that zeb had um uh, yeah. Growing up, that's uh, that yeah. would be. I mean, I just being around Lane when I was, and, and Steve. By the way, he mentioned great things about you when I was around him, um, and mm-hmm. he had a, a great amount of respect for what you're doing. And uh, but boy, if, if I could have, if I could sit with Lane for <laughs> uh, just a whole season every day, it, it would, yeah. it would have been tremendous. So I, I really treasure the time that I did get to spend with him, which wasn't a ton of time, but it was certainly enough to to make me feel like you know i was part of his world and he definitely was part of mine before he even knew who i was exactly and that that's the type of guy lane really was if the people that got to know him in his lifetime understand that and the people that didn't like i said before i really think they understand it too because he spoke at so many seminars um along the way and and uh different shows and that if anyone has sat into his seminars and watched him talk, he's got such a passion for what he's talking about, and he knows how to relate to a sportsman to the point where they walk out of that room feeling like they've known Lane all their lives. And that's why there's such a you know draw for people that have actually never sat down to dinner with him or gone on a turkey hunt like I have. I wish I had done a lot more. There wasn't just there wasn't enough time in the five years of knowing Lane was a very busy man, and I feel very fortunate to have had the time that I have gotten from him in the five years that I've known him. Um, and we had so many plans, but, um, that's, that's life. And, you know, we, we everybody has to go on and, uh, uh, hopefully I can continue to, um, you know, keep Zeb in my life and, uh, Irene, 
um, and uh, you know, keep tabs with the Benoit family. Uh, Lane was my connection, and uh, I, I would hate to lose that. They're great people, so... We next speak with Tom Blaze on the complexities of a mountain man. Lane was a complicated man, you know. I mean, I never got really close to him like I did with uh, Lanny and Shane. And I, I think in a lot of ways, uh, Lane was a lot like Larry. You know, he was, he was a hard man to, to get along with sometimes and really to understand, you know what I mean? Uh, they, You know, they were a lot alike in a lot of ways, I guess. But, yeah, we... Uh, we had some good times, though. You know, Lane was a, a heck of a deer hunter, you know. He was a big woods buck hunter, uh, like the rest of the Benoids. And, but he kind of, you know, hunted on his own, you know. He really didn't, uh, you know, hunt with the crowd like, I guess, Lanny and, and Shane and, and Larry kind of hunted together. And Lane always kind of, you know, did his own thing. He was kind of a lone wolf, you know. Sure, yeah. Now, you've uh, you videotaped Lane on a few of the hunts, as I recall. And oh, yeah. Some of the... Some of, actually some of the some of my more favorite hunts that I've seen on on some of the earlier DVDs are with uh, you videotaping Lane. And tell me a little bit about what it was like following Lane around when you you were on him with a camera. Well, I, Lane, he was good. You know, he he when I got a chance to film him. He was a real hardworking guy, you know. He, he really wanted to, uh, you know, to tell a lot and to, to get a lot of good footage, you know, he, whatever it took, you know, to get the good footage. He was willing to, to do that. He actually ran camera, too. I mean, he filmed, uh, you know, different camera guys and stuff like that and, and tried to do some self-filming, which is really hard to do, you know. So, he, he you know, he was uh, pretty easy to work with, I thought, you know, as far as... Uh, enthusiastic about getting getting footage and stuff some of the other Benoit, you know especially in the beginning they're like i just just want to hunt i just want to hunt you couldn't stop and say well let's film the track or talk about the sign that we're we're seeing you know you're all especially tracking just trying to catch up to the buck and, and shoot the deer but lane yeah he, he was definitely a hard-working guy you know and uh, i don't know so he, i guess one of the craziest things that happened Basically, Craig Jakes with the cameraman at the time was filming Lane, and I was filming Lanny about a mile away. And it was probably eight, nine o'clock in the morning, and we heard three fast shots, you know, long distance away. And I was with Lanny, but I, Lanny goes, "That's Lane." I go, Are "You sure?" He goes, "Yeah." And I'm thinking, well, well, maybe we should go down there and see if they got something, you know. And, and uh, so he goes, all right, we'll go down there because Craig was kind of a new camera guy, and I said, well, you didn't have that good a camera with microphones and stuff, so maybe we'll have to go down there. And, and do some reenactments or, you know, get get to recovery or something if he shot a deer. So we, we trucked down there. We knew where they were hunting. And we hiked back down it, in there. And uh, here's Lane and uh, Craig with a great big buck. I mean, this was, at the time, probably Lane's best rack buck, I think. It was in Canada. It was probably in the one, scored in the 160s, you know, a tremendous, mm-hmm. you know, big 5x5 five five buck, a uh, big body buck, too. And so uh, I said, well, I'll, I'll just work with these guys for a while. And, and Lane, said, well, okay, I'll pick you up in an hour. So all right. So he hiked back out of the woods. And so I was there with, with Lane and Craig. And, and I said, well, you know, tell me what happened. And uh, so he, I mic'd him up. And uh, and I said, just take me through the whole hunt and I'll film you. And Craig, you can run your camera, you know, behind me and learn and try to film. And I told Lane to uh, load his gun and maybe I'd have him. They didn't really get the kill that good. So I said, you know, just load your gun and maybe I'll just have you do some shooting and kind of get like a like a uh, a different camera angle or something like that. In post production, we can we can make it look a little better if, it, if you didn't get it that good. It's like all right. So basically, we filmed the interview of the deer and stuff like that. And then you know, it's been like maybe 15 minutes. And then we did a big circle. And he's showing us, you know, showing me and the camera, you know, how they found the spot, showing the sign, and walking around. And he's walking up to a spot where he's going to sit for the morning. And all of a sudden, this buck comes right up over the hill, another ten pointer, <laughs> and. uh Lane's like, Craig, 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 take my gun, take my gun. And uh, I'm just filming it, you know, right over the shoulder. And uh, Lane hands his rifle to Craig. Craig lays his camera on the ground. And this is, you know, we're doing a reenactment, but this is reality, you know. And all of a sudden, Craig takes it, pow, pow. He shoots that buck and it runs off. That deer dies. So now I got another reenactment. And they, I go, tell me, you know, what happened? This is crazy. And you see in the video, it's really real, you know. Yeah. Um, you know, that whole scene was crazy. And then I remember hiking back out of the woods, and, and uh, I met up with uh, Shane and 
and Lanny, and uh, he said, how did things go? And I said, uh, pretty good. I, go, I filmed, uh, I helped uh, Lane's hunt. I filmed a little bit of this and that, you know, the missing pieces. And I go, and uh, Craig shot a deer, too. <laughs> I got that on the film. And they're that's like, really? Great, like, yeah. That's a, that's a great story. That's yeah, a great it was story. Good, but it, and, yeah, I mean, things like that don't happen too often, and to get it on film is really cool, you know. <laughs> Absolutely. So, uh, it's intense. But I got a bunch of stories. You know, Lane, I knew those guys really well. You know, I, I spent a lot of time. I used to spend two to three weeks a year filming uh, the Benoits, and then I'd go do my hunts usually late season somewhere. And, uh, you know, I guess they were kind of like a rock band. You know, they, they kept together for 10 years. You know, most rock bands don't last that long. You got brothers working together, and they did it as a part-time business. It wasn't a full-time money-making thing for them doing books and videos. It was a wintertime project. Uh, they, they all had regular jobs. I mean, Lane was sheet rocker, you know, and he never quit that. Right. So, uh, you know, it, it was tough for those guys to get along in the business side of it. Um, so it, it deteriorated, you know, probably about five years ago. Uh, you know, uh, Larry was getting older and he was getting sick of doing it and they weren't getting along. And then kind of Lane spent time hunting with his dad before he passed away and they became a team and stuff. I thought that was kind of nice. And, and then Lanny and Shane were, they, they hunted together. But, uh, yeah, a lot went on. I mean, I don't know. Uh, there's a lot of things happened in deer camp. I probably should talk about, but, uh, well, another hunt, I remember I was with Lane, and uh, it was towards the end of the season. He was having a rough season. It, it, it's bad luck. Uh, he kind of nicked a big buck and didn't get that, and it got away, you know. It uh, was just a flesh wound or whatever. But anyway, he was getting really discouraged, and the other guys kind of had tagged out. I said, I got to go with Lane, you know, and try to get something in a couple, the next couple of days. And uh, So he, he was hunting a couple of areas. One area was a big uh, a big bog, and it was uh, you could get like 300-yard shots. It was like a a grassy open area um mm. and i said with his gun and i said well you know i've got a 300 wind mag it's a really nice gun and it shoots at the, you know i can shoot 600 yards with it it's got a real hair trigger. it's set up for shooting long range and so if you want i can lug that out there and uh he's like yeah yeah that'll be all right you know and so we had this buck come out one evening it was uh way the hell out there and uh he looked at me and he said oh maybe i should grab, grab that 300 i think all right so he had a shooting stick and i said it's a real hair trigger on that thing I'm, I'm just warning you it's less than two pounds and uh so he lines up on that deer and he just touches that trigger and wham and his hat blew around sideways you know because he really didn't hold the gun real tight yeah. and and he got the deer and uh he said i guess that thing's got a hair trigger <laughs> and uh no he liked that gun but he said man that's a hell of a gun and, but uh, no, we uh, we got that deer, and uh, I'm trying to think. You know, a, a lot. What we had in common is, uh, well, Wayne uh, well, he has a son, uh, Zeb, which is I think he's 23. He seems like you know we talk about our sons. You know, Wayne would talk about Zeb, and you know, oh, it's youth weekend, and somebody's taking him out, and I said, well, it's youth weekend, and my son's going out for the first time, so I think they're about the same age. My son's 23, and I think, I think Zeb is too. Uh, if Zeb's listening to this, I'm really sorry because, I mean, I lost my dad when I was 25. Uh, uh, my dad was 50 and I was 25, so I know what he's going through. Mm -hmm. Unexpectedly, uh, same type of deal. But, uh, but you know, we talked about our sons a lot. You know, he bragged up his son about wrestling. And, you know, he spent a lot of time with his son fishing and hunting and stuff, and I did the same thing. So we that was the biggest thing that, that Lane and I had in common. And we talked about it all the time. Our, our sons were the same age. So uh, I'll miss yeah. that, too. And, you know, I remember uh, when I did the segment, I forget what video it was. It might have been the third one. Uh, basically did a segment on each one of the Benoits and Larry, too. You know, what they did for work and stuff like that. Kind of like a profile. And uh, I remember going with Lane. And, uh, you know, uh, I spent uh, in the summertime. I went up there just for a day and was fishing with his son. And, but playing horseshoes, you know, he used to play horseshoes a lot, had a big horseshoe pit, and he did it competitively uh, around the area, too, pitching horseshoes and stuff. I think Shane, Shane probably got him into that a long time ago. Yeah. And then Snowmobile, and, you know, he lived, I don't know if you know where he lived, but, you know, his uh, woman, Irene, and Zeb, they lived Stevens Brook Road, you know, so they lived in a nice log cabin, dead-end road, no power, so he had solar and then a generator and he used to have to spark up that generator i remember going to his house filming him he's like oh, i gotta put wood in the stove and then he had to <laughs> fire up the generator yeah you know he's a mountain man you know he looked like a mountain man you know he's kind of uh intimidating looking guy you know he's the type of guy that uh, 
you kind of have to watch what you say to him, too, sometimes. Kind of like Larry, too. You're quick to fight, quick to get mad, you know what I mean? And Larry was like that, too, you know? So uh, he was he was kind of a brawler back in his younger days, too. And I'd, I'd seen him in action, you know, and, you know, especially if he was drinking a few beers. But, uh, but other than that, you know, he was... A, he was a good guy, you know. He's like I said, hard work and I remember going to one of his jobs. I said, Well, call me up, I gotta get some shots of you shoot rock and he goes, Oh, I got a job next week so I went up and it was probably in the winter time and uh, he had his brother, other brother working for at the time. Um, he goes, I didn't, he didn't want to be filmed or whatever, uh, but he used to hunt with him back in the day. But anyway, you know, Lane's up there on stilts, you know, uh budding the yeah. ceilings and stuff. I mean, that's hard work, you know, that's a rough life. You know, he's just a blue collar, hardworking guy, you know, and a big, a, a big buck hunter as well, you know. Right. Yeah. And, and I think a lot of us are that way. You know, we're blue collar yep. guys at heart and uh, we just love deer hunting. It's just, uh, I think that's kind of the nature of a lot of, a lot of us that are out there. Tom, what, what did you learn from Lane that you've added to your own hunting repertoire? I think the biggest thing about Lane, you know, I, out of all the really, I must say, you know, he wasn't really into, uh, I guess, gimmicks and stuff like that. They're all old school hunters and stuff like that. Uh, like Lane would be more of a scout and, uh, Shane's got, got a lot of different techniques as well. But, uh, Lane, uh, hunted probably harder than those, than anybody out of the group. Like he got up earlier, he stayed in the woods longer, you know, uh, you know, guys like Lanny, even Chang, you know, like Lanny does, he, he's not that serious about hunting. He scouts for the first week or two, and then he'll kill deer because he just like driving around and, and, and having people with him, yeah. you know, different type of guy, you know what I mean? Lane liked to be by himself, but in hunt hard right from the day, day, day one, he got to camp, whether he's in Maine or New Hampshire or wherever, you know, because yeah. uh, he, he'd be serious almost, you know, really really serious about hunting and then uh work i guess what i learned is like work ethic on hunting you know i I mean i personally don't hunt like that but i mean i hunt hard but every hour that you can spend in the woods you're just increasing your odds you know versus a lot of guys got a week or two weeks and then they screw they waste a lot of time a rainy day oh just stay home play guard well lane that's not lane but he would he'd be out there you know (laughs) out hour before light and an hour after light, you know, because that could be the day for him, you know, and he just, I think that's why he was really successful for shooting big deer. And, and I think, I think too, uh, you know, he, he got like, I think shooting that deer with Craig, that 160 class deer, and that was probably in 2001 or two, somewhere around the early 2000s. And then it, it changed him in a way of thinking about, boy, I like shooting deer with big rats instead of like, shooting deer that way to 250 or whatever so yeah you like still like the big deer mature deer but he really got more into the the, the big antler thing and that's kind of what i was into too and so him and i used to talk about that he, he got into scoring the rack to kind of understand you know what's a 140 class deer versus a 160 and the other bernice could, could give it about you know um score you know even to this right. day they, I, they like big racks and stuff but lane was the only one that kind of got modernized a little bit in that way, um, and also doing more, you know, thinking about, hey, maybe I should travel to the Midwest or, or go to some of these other places before I get too old and stuff, you know, and not just the big woods, maybe go venture, you know, off, you know, do something a little different. And uh, I think I've learned that from them too. And I said, well, I, I kind of think like that too, you know, I don't like, uh, I've only hunting the same piece of woods for 20 years, you know, maybe we should go, uh, you know, a thousand miles south or, you know, go, to, go do something different, something unique. Gotcha. Uh, Tom, what are you going to miss the most about Lane Benoit? Well, he's, what am I going to miss the most? A little bit of a uh, couple of things. One is, I mean, he's all, most of the time he's all a smile, yeah. you know, yep. and, and friendly with people, you know, and when we did, we used to do up to a 12 shows a year and, and some were, you know, like a three day event, like the Yankee sportsman show and Springfield show. But a lot of times they were just a one day show that somebody was putting on and, and did charity events, you know, they'd sell tickets and we'd go down there and, and we'd sell them our products at, you know, discount prices and stuff like that. So we'd go down there for a half a day and, you know, we had some, and a lot of times we went to dinner afterwards and stuff like that. So we had a really good time and, and talking to him, I really miss talking about big bucks with big rats, you know, talking score or talking, you know, somebody shot a X amount, you know, deer and scored so much in Northern Maine. Somebody shot one in Minnesota. It was so big. And 
talking about the big woods and talking about possibilities, how things change, you know, like Ontario was good for a number of years, then it got played out and, and what's, what's new, what's hot, you know, and in the big buck world and the big woods too, you know, because we both love, you know, I still love the big woods. I do most of my hunting in the big woods. When you got somebody like Lane, that, that's all they think about, you know, I mean, they, and he was a blue collar guy. I was a blue collar guy and I still am. I, I was a stone mason for 20 years and I owned a quarry. I went a quarry for 10 years. So I just sold that. So I basically used to bust my ass for seven months out of the year. And then I go take two months to go film and hunt and, and basically then do shows in the wintertime. So right. uh, he had the same mindset, you know, I'm going to work. I'll just shoot rock and then save my money. And that's the way all the nights are. And just, you know, and maybe, maybe we, we're not building a retirement fund, but you know, look at Lane. He didn't need a retirement fund, which sucks, but he lived, he hunted every year. He didn't miss a November. You know, he hunted almost every November, the whole month. And, uh, that he really lived that way. He lived good, you know, and he had a lot of, a lot of, uh, good memories in the woods. You, you're not going to remember a hard day at work, but you're going to remember a day in the woods, you know? So I guess that's what I'm going to miss most about is, you know, his stories too. Yeah. He used to tell a lot of anime, animated stories about um, a lot of bucks. He, he spent so much time in the woods that, you know, he had a lot of encounters. A lot of bucks got away and a lot of didn't. So yeah. um, you can learn a little bit from every story from everybody, you know? He'd listen to people's stories too. Unlike some famous hunters and stuff, you know, like blah, blah, blah. I remember at the shows and people would come up to Wayne and say, you know, tell him, their story and he would listen to all this. It was nice. Matt Trombley on getting to know the silent predator. A uh, huge fan of the Benoites and uh, following them with ever since his dad's first book came out. I got Larry's paperback as a young man in, in uh, high school. I think it was in eighth grade. My grandfather gave it for Christmas. I've always followed them. Um, and in the last 10 years, run into the boys up in Pittsburgh, New Hampshire. I've been hunting up there for, oh Lord, 15, 16 years now. And, uh, we stay at the same lodge that Dave Coker and, and Lane and stayed at. And I still talked to Dave, actually chatted with him this morning on Facebook, but, uh, um, had gotten to know Lane just like you on a personal basis in the last two years. Um, he approached me at a, uh, sportsman show down in New Hampshire last year and uh, talking about this wool clothing line that I, I got into a franchise with called Silent Predator uh, about five years ago. We, yep. we got into it myself and Ian Dewey, uh, a fellow firefighter from Lebanon, New Hampshire. Yep. You know, like I said, uh, uh, we were down in uh, Harrisburg. I literally just got home last night. Uh, Ian's still down there finishing out the show this week. Yep. And uh, I've also gotten to know Paul Dupuy, um, who is, as you know, uh, Lane's cameraman. Absolutely. And, yeah, Paul was the guy that, that uh, called me and texted me with the news. Yes. Yep. Well, the same thing. He, he asked me, he said, can you talk? And we had just gotten to the show booth on Monday morning. And I said, yeah. And uh, I called him and he says, uh, Irene found Lane Ben Bed. And I'm like, I was just dumbfounded. I'm like, are you serious? Um, hard to even process at first. So I blurted it right out in the show in front of everybody. It just it was hard to take in for a few minutes. I was speechless. It's it's one of those things that it just you don't want to believe it. You don't believe it initially. No, and you just try to tune it out. Like no, I was reading that wrong. Yeah, you know. And I've lost a lot of a lot of people over the last year, and and it just seems to it doesn't seem to end right now. And I don't really understand why. And I don't I don't know if we'll ever understand it completely. Um, their powers are great, large, much bigger than us. That have ways about them we'll never truly understand i don't think but it's uh, i couldn't agree more uh, i've dealt with the same thing and it's it's odd how a lot of times you talk with people that are having the same challenges in life whether it's a death in the family marital issues etc cetera, etc cetera. um in the last two years i've lost two very close friends that were hunters um uh, mentors to me my dad's best friend literally died 12 hours after they returned from pittsburgh new hampshire two years ago um day before thanksgiving and then the next spring we lost my mom's brother of both young in life in their 60s and yep. uh, you know like you said this is another one i literally shook hands with lane thursday night a week ago um picking up a case of dvds to take down to the show with us and i talked to him on the phone friday driving down there yep uh, right. that uh, we had a lot of uh, interesting ideas that Em and I were throwing around both with American Tracker um, and the Wolf Holding Line and how to promote it. And his go-getter attitude is 100% the type of person I am, the way I am with my charter business and 
um, pushing that forward, you know, looking at a second career path after my fire service career. Right. Yeah. Um, I've been in, I've been in the career fire service for 18 years now and started way back in high school as a volunteer and, uh, just been a huge passion of mine. I'll always be a fireman, but the outdoors is what my whole family eat, sleeps and breathes. I've kind of taken it to the next level, making business out of it. But, um, been a licensed charter captain for five years now and my business continues to grow and, um, uh, had Lane out in Lake Ontario with Paul and, and Zeb last year for two days and really got a chance just to meet who the inner guy was, you know, and, yeah. uh, just a phenomenal weekend. And my son, my first mate at 13 years old, was there to witness it too. I'm so glad now that uh, where we stand. Yeah, and uh, Paul and Lane had both told me about the trip they were taking out to Lake Ontario. So you're the guy that they were yes. referring yep. to. So you you were going yep. uh, salmon fishing, right? Yes, indeed. Yep. Yeah. Uh, just uh, it was, I saw a lot of photos. I mean, Lane was in his element. And he's... Yeah. He's just such an authentic person, you know. There was nothing fake about the guy. He was just, just None whatsoever. When I first met him, I went to Paul's house. Um, well, I'd met him years before, and we we got we tied on quite a few uh, tied on a good one and had quite a few beers at a lecture. Uh, and he doesn't remember that, and uh, quite frankly, I don't either. <laughs> um, all that well, but he. Uh, when I went to actually sit down and have dinner with him, and then we were talking about this North American tracker project and, and Paul and, and Lane want to sit down and get to know me a little bit better. You know, who's this stranger we're bringing in he seems to have some things going on and we need his help with some stuff. But you know, the first thing Lane said to me was you don't look like any, you don't look anything like your picture on Facebook, <laughs> you know, and to have somebody like Lane say that to you, like, you know, this, he, he's such a, a simple guy when it comes down to the, the woods, and, and he, he 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 dumbed it down. But inside, he he had, he was a cra- he was a crafty guy. He, like he he knew his steps, he knew his strategies, and to yep. say that hey, you don't look like you're on Facebook, he thinks way outside the box when when you don't really expect to, that from somebody the way he looks. You know what I mean? Yes. Yep. He's he got a beard. He's a he's a woodsman. But but he's still connected to everything, and that was the best oh, best part about Lane. Yeah, no doubt. Him and I had, had some lengthy conversations, literally, in the last three months of so this time of year, with the sportsman shows going on, and we've been really working hard at this whole promotional thing. Uh, Ian and I have been struggling with the wool clothing line since we bought into it to really see it take off to fruition to what we wanted to see, and to doggone it, we really need to get a pro staffer that people recognize that believe in our product, and uh, unfortunately, to the demise of Beagleware, and, and know the two owners of that very well, uh, one of them is a fellow Burlington fireman, um, when the boys uh, lost their deal with them, um, you know, there was obviously the lack of interest in, in uh, Shane and Lanny to go after much, I, I think, as far as making any further production out of it. But Lane was not going to be put down. It, uh, he was looking, obviously, to take off with American Tracker and, and pick up a new wool clothing line. And he came to us. He really he tried the product uh, down in New Hampshire last year. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a very outgoing person. I teach fire training a lot for the State Fire Academy. So sitting up in front of people, jibber-jabbing is very easy for me and, and him and I just headed off and I said, you know, I followed you my whole life and I was just astonished that one of the knights wanted to be part of what we have to offer. So it just blossomed from there. Yeah. Hey, he was and he was an he was a businessman too, an opportunist and um and, you know, the opportunity tracking a big buck I think kind of translated into life as a business person too and um he knew how to track down that opportunity as well. He, and he wasn't shy about it and he had a method about it. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. He, uh, you know, his, his uh, don't give up attitude is something that uh, is my parents kind of pick on me, if you will, about. I'm, I'm one of, I'm the oldest of three boys, and uh, grew up as a dairy farm kid in Florence, Vermont. And uh, by God, I said I'm going to be a career firefighter, and took off into college for it. So that's you know, I, nothing has ever stood my way of going after what I believe in. My dreams are, and right. sometimes uh, to financially a little challenges, but. Uh, uh, you know, Lane's attitude is the same way. And him and I talked a lot just in the last six weeks about where we'd like to see this next step go between American Tracker and the wool clothing line and how do we promote it and more trips that we could film together and um, different opportunities to help each other push forward. And uh, he was just wound about it, you know, just all these different ideas. And um, we had put together three different uh, pieces of our line with a wool clothing, a vest, a jacket, and a pair of pants that 
had his specific features on it and um, had great rapport on it so far with the three shows we've done this year. And literally, it just came out the first of January. Right. So Ian and I are just stunned that the efforts we put forward to this are now on hold, obviously, to see what goes next. You know? Yeah, it, it came as uh, an incredible shock. Uh, just n- nothing you ever want to hear. Um, it taken way before his prime. I just I don't feel Without like. A doubt. You know, he was just getting ramped up again and, and breaking off into his own brand. And um, just uh, just as a representative, as he was of the outdoor industry, the, it, I feel like you lost a piece of your of yourself uh, yeah. when, when you heard the news because um, he represents something that is very core in all of us as outdoorsmen, and as sportsmen. And he did it, he did it better than anybody. Without a doubt, without a doubt. You know, it, uh, I can recall probably five years ago um, going in to grab a pizza at a little place called the Buck Rub Pub up in Pittsburgh, New Hampshire. Yes, sir. I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> um, and uh, we're all sitting there, and of course, you know, uh, I think a lot of people look at him and the boys as the Hollywood end of, of New England and, and big, weird deer, big woods deer hunting. Sure. But for us, just kind of that reality that, hey, we're in the country that these guys want to be in, you know, and we love Pittsburgh, we love the big woods, and, and I'm, I'm uh, absolutely beside myself and my 13-year-old son would rather go up there and hunt and go sit in a tree stand in Ohio because I've got a lot of opportunities that I've networked with. And But Lane was the one of the three boys that, you know, you go up to him, shake hands, and he just start talking hunting. And uh, um, as I said, you know, how close him and Dave Coker were growing up. And um, Dave is always, he'll come over to camp and just sit at the table and chew the fat and show pictures and talk stories. And and my son, my dad are just enamored with that, just to hear the stories, you know. Yeah. But uh, that's just the type of guy he was, just friendly to everybody. And, um, um, he, you know, he put his wing around me in the last six months and to really believe that we could take off and, and look at things in a much different light. And um, I, I, like I said, just was really looking forward to building something that could be wonderful and yep. uh, just dumbfounded right now. Yep. His uh, his spirit was alive, and it still is today. I mean, I, 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 oh, without I, a doubt. Even though he may not be physically with us, his spirit is alive and well. Uh, very much so. I apologize. I'm tearing up a little bit. No, I, uh, I'm right there with you. I sat and watched his video, and uh, we had a TV down um, in Harrisburg at our booth, I and mean, we were playing his video, and, and he and I were almost uh, set back, and we had a quiet time when we didn't have anybody in the booth with us. And yeah. To sit and watch the dedication that he did to Larry, um, to literally see the last buck that Larry ever shot on film with Lane sitting there and say, wow, they're together up there reminiscing about that deer right now. Yep. And uh, you're right. Me and I were, were choked up about it ourselves and say, we're looking at a piece of history right here. And um, just hard to kind of process it, I guess. Yeah. It, it's, it still hasn't sunk in, but, uh, boy, he just he did so much for the outdoors, so much for the hunting industry, and just in fishing, too. I mean, he, he was he, – he loved fishing. He just loved being outside. And, and if, if I don't know if they'll ever make another one like him. No, without a doubt. We had uh, – a very up and down season out in Lake Ontario last year. Every charter captain would tell you that due to Mother Nature's pressures with the cold weather throughout the winter time that affected our salmon fishing. But um, the first evening they came out with me, we only had a couple of bites and we couldn't get anything landed. And, and that typical "don't give up" attitude. Lane's like, "Tomorrow morning's a new day. We trust you. You know, you tell us what we got to try and do." And we started off with a brown trout program in the morning, which the browns are. Uh, fish that stay on their normal structure out there in the same waters for the most part, uh, not real migratory. So we were able to put three or four to boat, dropped a couple others, got some good footage. And I said, all right, you know, you want to switch it up and try and get a king on film. And then without a doubt, you know, Lane, that's the, the big buck of the world out there for a king salmon. So I switched up my patterns and we headed for deeper water offshore and we crossed into probably 325 foot of water. And um, one of our long lines called copper line takes off. And then wouldn't you know, it ends up being a 25-pound king, and it took us probably better part of 25 to 30 minutes to get in the boat. Got some awesome footage, and Lane was just beside himself. Uh, you know, you would have thought he just shot a booner, and he said, this is his first king salmon ever, and, and it meant the world to me to be there with him to show him my end of it. And he says, dude, you got something special here. Not only are you good in front of the camera, but he says, you were enthusiastic about teaching people, and, and, and he says, you showed me a thing or three on how to work these fish. And um connection that it uh, left me speechless.
And finally, we speak with my good friend John Clucky from Clucky Outdoors on picking up where you left off. I mean, we just had such good times together, no matter what. We could be apart for a year, a month, a day, and it would pick right back up where we left off. Um, I met him, I can't even tell you how many years ago, um, when I was racing snowmobiles, and Lanny was racing snowmobiles, and uh, that's how we first met. So it was back in the 70s, late 70s, early 80s, maybe. Um, that's how I first met him. And then we, we all became friends as, as hunters and just, you know, kept in touch. And then uh, along, I think, I'm trying to think, I was trying to think about this earlier, what year we finally got together to hunt. Because he always wanted to turkey hunt, but just never got around to it. You know, just always wanted to do it. And I'm like, listen, this year, you got to come down, stay with me, and we'll get you out turkey hunting. Well, needless to say, we got a bird. He got his first bird or I think maybe second bird or whatever it was. And uh, and uh, from there on in, and then I went up to his place, stayed with him, and we turkey hunted up there. I, I never got to deer hunt with him, unfortunately, because we just always couldn't connect. You know, um, he was busy, I was busy, and uh, we were going to do it this year. And, you know, look what happened. You just never know. That's why you have to do things when you can and really make an a, a effort to, to do the things that you want to do in life because it's a perfect example. I mean, he was one of my best friends It just very hard to get over that you know you can't stop thinking about it you're trying to function in life and it's just a hard thing to swallow it is and you know he he was such a uh, such a, a, a presence if you're ever around him like you know how some of those guys just they just kind of take over the room in a sense when they're there he was one of those guys and he didn't even try he was just he was just just there and you're like that's and, annoying and that that's what was nice about lane because um he just he wasn't cocky or anything like that he always took time to talk to people you know if they had a question he'd, he'd answer it it was just it just if he just stood by and watched him for instance like at, at that concord show last year was a perfect example right of him at his finest just talking to young kids, uh, you know, older people, just whatever was happening, he was right there and he just wanted to be a part of it. And uh, that's that's what's so sad when you lose somebody like that. That was just such an asset and such an inspiration to all the other hunters out there. It didn't matter who it was, you know, he just, that's the way he was. Yeah. And it's, it's truly, truly, truly going to be missed by myself and, you know, a lot of people that I know. Very much so. Uh, John, what, what's your fondest memory of Lane? Like a, 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 moment, a moment you had with Lane. In, in, okay, I, I'm I'm filming him up in Vermont, right? And we're uh, he's using the muzzle loading shock. So yeah. we're we're on these turkeys. And first of all, when Lane says we're going to take a hike, man, I want to tell you what: get ready to take a hike. <laughs> I'm not lying. We drove. We drove his, his Jeep there, his old Jeep, up this mountain road off. I'm like, where the hell is it going? And we heard a bird gobble. And this bird, I'm not kidding you, had to bend a mile away up on the top of this ridge. He goes, let's go. we got to get up there. I'm like, all right. So I got a tripod, a camera, and all the gear and stuff. And we just start going. So we get up there, right, and we locate the bird. And, and, and we're looking like two, two dogs crapping roof and nails trying to find a place to sit down because he gobbled like 30 <laughs> yards away. So we look at each other, eyes got real big, and we just sit down, and right about 10 yards in front of us, there's like this mound. It's like where they, maybe years ago, where they logged or something, and it was just like this just big hump, right? So we start calling a little bit, and I'm filming, and this bird is getting so close that you can, I mean, you just feel the gobbles and spitting in the drum, and he was, he was within less than 10 yards, and we never shot that bird. Hmm. He would not wow. stick his head up over it. He kept coming, coming, and then he got to that point, where that high point was, and he could not, he would not commit to come over that. And we sat there and sat there and sat there. That was pretty much one of the best times. And then when he did finally shoot his bird, he doesn't tell me that he's hard of hearing. I mean, when I say hard of hearing, you, can't, you have to yell at him. So now you're turkey hunting, and you're trying to film a turkey hunt and be on the same page as the hunter when to shoot the bird. So I'm like, lane, shoot, lane, shoot. And now the bird's getting further, further to my right, and I'm having a hard time panning to the right. And finally, I pretty much yelled at him and then shot the bird. So it was pretty it was pretty comical. But he goes, I, I can't, I couldn't hear you. I'm like, that would have been nice to know before all this happened. <laughs> so those two memories right there were, were pretty much uh yeah and then down here turkey hunting with me of course it was just it was just awesome we had just had such good times just laughing all the time and just uh talking about the stuff we love to do yeah and uh it's just i'm glad i'm so glad i was able to, to uh you know share that time with him 
spending some time with Lane myself, he seemed to have a lot of little mannerisms and idiosyncrasies. He always he had a, like a slew of sayings. Was there any saying that he would say more often than next that you liked the most? Ah, oh, jeez, I, I can't. I know what you're talking about because he did it a lot when we were together, and he just he just make you laugh. Yeah, he always had something to say, and it was just absolutely hilarious. And uh, I I don't have one right off the top of my head, sure. but I can remember him saying that. And the funny thing is, is it was really kind of weird. After he passed, I I got the call that morning, and it was like all I all I heard all day long was him talking. I couldn't get it out of my head. Just him talking about the stuff that we talked about, like he was still right there. Yeah. It was kind of weird, but that's what happened that that whole day, that first day. It was like he was just right there. He's still okay. Yeah, it, it it it's amazing how you can instantly go back to moments and hear him talking to you as though you're standing next to him when something like this happens. It's it's uncanny, and I can remember several of the words that Lane said to me the the last time I was physically next to him at a at Paul's house over in Washington, just hanging out on the front porch, drinking a beer with him. Um, the the first thing he said to me, actually, when I got out of my truck, and granted, he, he's met me prior to this, but he had never, he hadn't seen me in a long time, and he hadn't hung out with me in a while, and he didn't really remember who I was, even though he knew of my work and the podcast and the Facebook page and all that stuff, and he wanted me to be a part of his North American Tracker team, which I emphatically said yes. He wanted to check me out a little bit, and when when my my Facebook profile picture is that of me with my Duck Dynasty beard, and I get out of my truck, and Lane <laughs> looks at me, and I look at him, and I don't look anything like Lane now. I'm just, I'm a clean shaven guy. He goes, you don't look anything like your Facebook picture. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There you go. Exactly. That was the that first thing awesome. he said to me. He says, yeah, this is Duck Dynasty, man. Sorry. And you'll never forget that. Never, ever, ever. ever. Yep. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, you know, I got another, another time was when he took me to his dad's house when I was up there. And I mean, literally spent probably better part of at least a half a day, if not more, just with his dad in his house. He let me. Not that it was a big house. You just do whatever you want. Just go walk around, look at everything. And just some of the stories between Lane and his dad that day was just absolutely incredible. I mean, absolutely incredible. The, just the stuff that we talked about and that his dad talked about and the stories. I just, it was it was just amazing. Yeah. And his dad ended up giving me one of his books and like one of his uh, commemorative coins. I don't know if you've ever seen one. It's kind of a neat thing. Mm. No, but, uh, I don't think I have. Maybe that and a book and a couple other things. It's really, really neat. Really neat. John, was there anything, anything that you changed or added to your hunting skill set that you learned from Lane? Yeah, I mean, as a, as a deer hunter, he he was a tracker. I I never got into that because I just I never was brought up with that and, and never really learned how to do it. But as we're walking in the woods, turkey hunting, he was just showing me things and and signing what to look for as far as, you know, the buck track, the stride, how wide that track is, um, how that deer acted through this this type of terrain had a lot to do with how big the deer was and what was on top of his head. I mean, just all kinds of neat stuff that, um, that he told me that, you know, I kind of knew some of it, but a lot of it I did not know. And boy, I'll tell you what, it's a, it's a real eye opening experience when somebody points some different things out to you that you've never seen before. Right. And all of us as hunters, you know, 10 people can walk through the woods and 10 people see 10 different things. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's not, everybody doesn't see the same. Right. What would you say you're going to miss the most about Lane? His laugh. Yeah. And just being around him. Yep. Just, that was awesome. Yep. <clears throat> yeah, it's it's a sad day in the hunting community. It's certainly, it's, uh, I wish we were getting together on different circumstances. And yeah, tonight, that's exactly. But, but, yep. Yeah, yeah. I've shed but quite a few tears over this. You and me both. Yep. It's hard to spend a lot of time with somebody that, you, you know, just had so much fun with that's all yeah yeah we will forever miss lane he was a heck of a hunter and just a a great guy and i learned a lot from him and i don't know they've only made one of lane but exactly that that mold was broke for sure that that he was one of a kind so no and like i said i'm just happy that i was able to spend time with him me too me too
Dusty. He had a blast. Yeah, just, uh, you know, you watch his videos and his, you know, as he's in the woods and he's, you know, he's spreading a tip that nobody else but Lane Benoit could spread because it, it, it was a factual tip. And, you know, that, that's what separated Lane Benoit from everybody else I've, I've ever known is the fact that he was willing to lead you to the success of a harvest through his skills. He, he, he wasn't hiding anything. You know, is, is there something that you could tell us there that uh, Lane taught you as far as the turkey hunt? We'll even go into the turkey hunt. Right. Um, as far as the deer hunting part, what was neat was just when you were, like you said, the presence of him, when you were standing around and he was talking to a crowd of people, nobody else was talking. They were paying attention to what he had to say. Mm. And and to me, just be, uh, you know, standing by watching that was kind of awesome to see because, uh, you know, a lot of people just think they know it all, to be honest with you. And obviously we, we don't, none of us do. But when he talk in the head of seminars i mean everything that was coming out of the man's mouth was was uh you know real good information and if you took it you could put it to use and you could definitely make it work for sure that is so true you just you sit there if he started talking you everybody shut up in the circle and just exactly. listen you did not exactly. want to miss a single comment at all no that was uh that was kind of neat to see that uh, you know, not that, too many that, people that can get your attention like that Right, that that's what separated Lane Benoit from everybody else. You know, he 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 was, uh, you know, the man when it comes to tracking. Absolutely, absolutely. Mm-hmm. It's just you know, and I know you didn't spend a lot of time with him, but I know you heard some of the stories, and you're like, if if this was any other person that you might not know, you'd be going, this guy's full of baloney. <laughs> But it was fact. Every damn bit of it was fact. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Awesome. It 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 was was amazing. It was definitely amazing. (laughs) Awesome and amazing. The the information. You know, Jay and myself were very, very fortunate to have him as a guest on the show. And wow, I mean, you know, that's something that we can listen to and go back to and and really think that uh, Lane Benoit was the very best at tracking. You know, he. Not not cocky, laid back. No, and, that's what and, I liked about him. Not at all. And he would help you. Absolutely. That, he would that's help what. You. That was a unique thing. Had all that information and, and was one hundred percent glad to help you. Exactly. Yep. Did you ever get a chance to drive anywhere with him on dirt roads or anywhere? Not really, but uh, <laughs> other than just like walking around, the, you know, a dirt road. No, I'm talking no. driving in a vehicle. Well, yeah, I, think <laughs> I, I, this. I think I know I'll what you're getting you what, at. His, I got to hear this. This is kind of like you, Dusty. Like when we're out, when we're we were driving wow. through Ohio. <laughs> so, now, like, you know, I hadn't known him. A, I mean, I knew him, but I never been with him to drive around with him. So we're up in Vermont, and we're going we're going to do some scouting for turkey. And you know, he had that jeep, and uh, he starts going on these dirt roads, and I'm like, "Where's the freaking seat go? <laughs> I'm like, "We are gonna die." Yep. You a little nervous? I'm like. Not really, but man, you're driving awful fast on these roads. He could he could have closed his eyes and drove these roads. I mean, he grew up there. He knew these roads like the back of his hand. But still, you as a passenger, not being familiar with any of these dirt roads that got bankings that just go off into nowhere, and he's just hammering this thing. I'm like, <laughs> oh crap! Uh, yeah, so funny. it was it was it was quite a bit of fun. Yep, I, I feel like Lane would be the guy that's always looking out in the distance and along the side of the road for that track and and for oh, something. Yeah. I'm the same way, and Jay, Jay can vouch for that. I'm all over. You know, I'm driving, but yet I'm scanning. And yeah. that's what separates the hunters and the people that are paying attention because I'll have passengers in my vehicle and I'm like, oh, there's a deer. And they're like, where? And it's just something that we pick out. We're always scanning, always. It's something that we do. Yeah, amazing. All, uh, 365 days a year, it does not matter. If you're in a vehicle and you can see, you're looking for critters. And that's um, that's a neat thing. It really no, I'm, sure, I'm, I'm sure Lane Benoit was just exactly like that. And, and another thing he, he said to me, and, and I, I heard some of this before, but and this makes perfect sense. And if you think about this, first of all, when you're scouting, uh, uh, I always have binoculars with me, no matter what. You're in my vehicle. It's a great scouting tool. And that's 365 days a year also. And then people look for a deer. You don't look for just a deer. You look for an ear, a tail whip, a, a leg. If you use those skills to look for deer in the woods, you are going to be way more successful than looking for a deer. Right. And that is a fact. Amazing. That is exactly right. And I was about to say that. It's like, 
you know, the people that they have a hard time seeing the deer, but I don't see the deer. I, I just saw a leg right. or, or a tail whip or, or an ear flick or a part of an antler. Right. And uh, the, all those things are, are important as a hunter. It's the flick you see through the brush in a, at a hundred yards. Correct. You're like, that's a deer. Like, how do you yep, know? Exactly. <laughs> Trust me. Exactly. Yeah. So, well, John, this has been a pleasure. Thanks for coming on the Big Buck Podcast and sharing your insights and knowledge and and your friendship with uh, about Lane Benoit they, and how you knew him and and uh, over many many years. And uh, he'll be severely missed. Uh, but it's it's nice to hear that some of his friends tell some stories. So I, he we, will never be forgotten. That's for sure. Never forgotten. Never ever forgotten. And thank you guys so much for having me on. It's always a pleasure. Thanks for tuning in to episode 100 of the Big Buck Registry's Big Buck Deer Hunting Podcast, a tribute to Lane Benoit, part one. In tomorrow's episode, the tribute to Lane Benoit, part two, we have dinner at Paul's house. Paul Dupuy, Lane's last cameraman, we feast on venison from Lane's last buck over wine at a country-setting dinner table in central New Hampshire at Paul's cabin. Can't wait.